but let's preach a little bit, all right? Uh, I want to preach today uh, from the book of Luke, chapter 22, verse 41 through 44. The message translation says it like this. He pulled away from them about a stone's throw, knelt down, and prayed. Father, remove this cup from me, but please, not what I want. What do you want? At once, an angel from heaven was at his side, strengthening him. He prayed on all the harder. Sweat wrung from him like drops of blood, poured off his face. Would you bow with me, Lord God? I thank you now that you give us this opportunity on Palm Sunday to remember and reflect on the sacrifice and the conversation in the Garden of Gethsemane. We love you. We give you these moments. It's in Jesus' name we pray, and everybody said together, amen. Hey, look, today I want to preach for the next few moments from the thought, I needed the nails. I needed the nails. As I begin to think about uh, the world that we're living in and the many exposures that I'm sure all of us could share as common in our lives, I begin to think that we need to remind ourselves that in the midst of all the conflict and chaos of our world, the character of God is unchanging. And what does that mean for us as Christians as we respond? And I just want to encourage you today that as we begin to look at our lives, there is still something that God is doing not only in the world, but doing in you, and he has purpose for you even in a time like this. As I begin to think about this sermon, I begin to think about a survey of the relationships in my life, and I'm sure as many of you could argue the survey of relationships in many of your lives and uh, we have many types of friends and associates and people that we interact with. Uh, but there's one type of person I want to center on today. One type of person that probably is familiar to all of us. We all have someone in our life that is generally someone who's resilient in spite of the circumstances. You might label them in many different ways. Maybe you label them as someone who's nonchalant. Maybe you label them as someone who goes with the flow. But I per per particularly believe the term that best fits this person is this term, unbothered, unbothered. An unbothered person is a person who can look at life and experience disappointment and difficulty, maybe even experience a season of defeat, struggle, obstacle, and opposition. And yet, in spite of that, they stay the same. They are unchanging. They are unbothered. As I begin to think about the definition of this word in the Urban Dictionary, it says indifferent to criticism or negative commentary, not easily annoyed, watch this, or provoked. In other words, you can't make them something you're not. You can't criticize them into compromising their character. You can't irritate them into changing their identity. You can't introduce enough things to hurt them to make them become unhealthy in their practices. They are generally people who can hear opinions, attitude, opposition, and still remain the same, unbothered. I'm certain we all know people like this. As I begin to think about my own life, y'all, I got some unbothered people I know. I got a cousin named Toya. That's how I got to say it. I got a cousin named Toya. Toya is unbothered. She don't care what you think. She don't care what you say. Toya is going to be Toya. My daddy is an unbothered person. I love my father. He is a type of person that throughout my life, no matter what room he walks into, he acts like him. Vernon Gordon Jr. don't change for nobody. And I love that about my father. It showed me what it meant to be true to who you are, no matter your circumstances. And it didn't mean that there weren't a multiplicity of opinions around him, but he remains true to who he is. My grandfather was one of those people. Man, God rest his soul. He was somebody who didn't change for nobody. But one of the greatest examples I saw growing up was my cousin Timmy and Torn. Let me tell you about Timmy and Torn. We grew up, me and Timmy graduated together. Torn was a year or two behind us. But these cousins of mine were different. I don't know if you got some cousins who are different, but these cousins were different. In particular, Timmy and Torn, very early in our lives, in our teenage years, fell in love with the 80s culture, so much so that they knew all the house party dance moves. I mean all of them. I'm talking about like this and then turn around and slide between. Like, they could do all the house party dance moves. They were so into 80s culture, my cousin Torn would walk around with a beatbox or a boombox in the 2000s. It was so uncommon. We thought he was weird, but he had such a confidence in who he was. My cousin Timmy had a high top fade. I'm not playing with y'all. I'll find the pictures and post them. My cousin Timmy and Torrin 
were so amazing. And in the midst of them being different from everybody else, in the midst of them hearing people say, you should cut that off, or you should stop dressing like that, or y'all should stop doing those dances, they remained unbothered. I always admired their resolve. I always admired their sense of identity. And as I begin to think about the people in all of our lives, I got to be honest with you, being unbothered didn't start with Timmy and Torin or my father or my cousin Toya or my grandfather, but over 2,000 years ago, there was somebody who modeled being unbothered very well. In our reading today, we encountered Jesus, and this is a pivotal point as we look at Palm Sunday. Jesus is preparing for a turning point in his journey. He's been doing ministry for three years, and now his mission meets this moment where he's about to have to make a choice, and he finds himself in the Garden of Gethsemane. And, and what's interesting about this passage is Jesus begins a conversation with the Father in heaven about his next steps. Now, before we go any further, let's look back at Jesus' history for a few moments, shall we? This is Jesus, right? Unbothered. I'm talking about the same person who was born in a place that they said no good things could come from, a little town called Nazareth. And yet, in spite of all the opinions about where he came from, Jesus said, I'm unbothered. He even went back to this place, and in spite of all the attitudes and opinions around him, he could do no miracles in the place where he grew up, the people he loved, the people he knew as family and friends, but yet still he remained unbothered. This is the same Jesus, same Jesus, who found himself born into controversial circumstances. And I'm certain that as Jesus was growing up, they were like, you know, that's Mary and Joseph's son, right? That one who Mary said she ain't had him with nobody else, but that's the one. And yet still Jesus continued on in his journey unbothered. Same Jesus, same Jesus, who went to a tax collector's house named Zacchaeus, and everybody was complaining around him, and yet he still remained unbothered. Or the same one who stood in the middle of someone's trial, a woman caught in the midst of adultery, and yet, even though he rest, risked his reputation, remained unbothered. Okay, let me take it a step further. This is the same Jesus, same Jesus, who kept some questionable company. Like, so much so that Pharisees and Sadducees showed up, and they asked him, why are you hanging out with them? And Jesus, of course, gives this amazing discourse of words to help them to understand his true mission. But here's what's interesting. In the midst of everybody complaining about the company he kept, Jesus remains unbothered. Same Jesus who was betrayed by some of his best friends. His, his, one of his right-hand men uh, turned him in, and then 11 of his disciples disappeared and abandoned him when he needed them the most. And yet still... After he gets up from the grave, he shows up to find them and fishes with them and feeds them unbothered. I got to tell you, when I look at Jesus' life and how unbothered he was by opinions, by circumstances, by pain, by brokenness, by all the things around him, this gives me some tension when I look at Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane. This text confounds me because for the first time, Jesus seems bothered. For the first time, Jesus seems a little flustered, a little frustrated. Jesus seems to be at odds or at inner tension in a way that we haven't seen in any of the other moments of his life. Here's Jesus struggling with the next step. And as I begin to see Jesus engage with the Father in the Garden of Gethsemane, I think we all could place ourselves in a garden in our own lives right now. And if you be honest about what you're looking at in your world and in your immediate circumstances. Maybe you feel like you're in a garden season right now. Maybe you're looking at the Father saying, Father, what are you doing? Father, what are you up to? Father, what will you do next? Maybe you, like me, we've had some intense prayer moments over the last couple of weeks saying, Father, what are you up to? And maybe like Jesus, we're asking that this cup would pass. It's in the midst of of this dialogue and discourse that Jesus has with the Father that we're privy to listen into, that we see some interesting dynamics. Here's what's interesting. The first thing I love about this particular passage is that Jesus pleads with the Father, and the Father responds to his need. Don't miss it. The text tells us that an angel came at once. That means with urgency. That means immediately. The angel comes at once, but look at what happens. God responds to his need, strengthens him, without removing his nails, still pushes him forward. Wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. I thought God responded to his need. His request was, let this cup pass from me. God responds to his need without removing his nails. Could I suggest to you, because sometimes the nails are necessary. What if 
Like Jesus, sometimes God isn't removing some of the pain, but preparing you for it. What if, if you look at all of our lives, even as we look at the context by which we're living in now, can we be honest? Maybe there's some things we're looking at in our world and we're saying, Lord, I thought you were going to remove it. Maybe many of our prayers have been like Jesus's. Jesus, I don't want this cup. God, can you take this away? And what if, just what if, God is looking for us to ask the second thing that Jesus asked. But Father, what do you want? This is, this is profound for me because I had to wrestle with this in my own prayer life as I began to petition God for all the things I wanted. I had to take it one step further the way Jesus did and ask, but Father, what do you want? I have to imagine that in the midst of anything going on in our world, God still is up to something. So the question is not always, God, can you give me what I want? The question for some of us should be, God, what do you want? Could I suggest to you that I refuse to believe God is wasting this time in your life? I do not believe God is wasting this moment for you. I believe without a shadow of a doubt that God is using this. And I think all of us need to take two steps back and say, God, in the midst of me worrying, I need to also wrestle with what do you want to get out of me in this season? If you are a spouse, you need to say, what do you want to get out of me as a better husband or wife? If you are a parent, what do you want to get out of me as a better parent? If you are someone who's in business, what do you want to get out of me and how do you want to change? Even as a pastor, I'm asking the question, God, what do you want for our church on the other side of this? Can I be honest with you? Our church is going to change on the other side of this. Can I be honest with you? Your marriage is going to change on the other side of this. Can I be honest with you? Your kids are going to change on the other side of this. The question is not if it will happen, but if we'll be in alignment with God when it happens. And that's what Jesus helps us to wrestle with in this text, is that he looks at the nails in front of him and said, Father, if it's what you want, I'm with you. He said, I'm not quitting on my assignment. I'm not quitting on my purpose. I'm not quitting on my anointing. I'm not quitting on my future. Because sometimes you need the nails. Sometimes we need the struggle. Muhammad Ali, one of the greatest boxers of all time, float like a butterfly, sting like a bee. You might remember that. I don't know about y'all, but I, I've been doing boxing workouts too, and, uh, and, and they the realest workouts, you know, because you're trying to figure this thing out at home. And I did some boxing workouts, and I said, man, I'm going to be like Muhammad Ali. And, uh, yeah, I stopped that after a week because those things are out of control. Let me tell you something. If you Google boxing workouts, I'm just going to stick right now to some basic cardio because that is another level of cardio. Trust me. Take your time. But I was looking at some Muhammad Ali quotes the other day, and one of the things that Muhammad Ali said that I thought was so interesting, and it's a very familiar quote, he said, I hated every minute of training. But I said, don't quit. Suffer now and live the rest of your life as a champion. Some of you, I know many of us, feel like we're in a season of suffering right now, and our country, our world is suffering. But maybe we have to channel those words. I don't like it, not a minute of it, but I'm going to suffer the right way now so that I can be a champion later. Isn't that what Jesus shows us? Jesus shows us that I'm going to go through the suffering because I know there's resurrection and victory on the other side. And I came to let somebody watching know today that the suffering you're experiencing this season has nothing on what God wants to do with you in the next season. He's going to resurrect some things in your marriage. He's going to resurrect some things in your business. He's going to resurrect some things in our church. He's going to resurrect some things in your family. He's going to resurrect some things in your health, all because we decided to suffer the right way. And Jesus needed the nails. Why? Because if there's no cross, there's no grave. If there's no grave, there's no resurrection. If there's no resurrection, he couldn't get the glory. He doesn't get the glory. We don't have a gospel. The good news is he needed the nails so that he could save our lives. And the truth of the matter is we need some nails. As you begin to look at your life, I believe that if you look back far enough, you'll see that there were some seasons that it felt like you were being nailed. But the truth of the matter is what hurt you in one season helped you in another season. You needed the nails. Yes, it confused you, but then it constructed you. You needed the nails. Yes, it challenged you, but then it gave you courage. You needed the nails because, yes, it broke you, but then it built something in you. All of us have seasons where we need the nails because what God has for us on the other side is greater than anything we see right now. And Jesus, out of love for us, care for us, compassion for us, passion for his assignment, 
chooses the nails. And our victory was the other side of it. This is why communion matters. Communion doesn't just matter because of his religious routine or religious rhetoric. It matters because Jesus had a choice in the garden. The same way you and I have a choice about how to navigate this season. To, to, to manage our suffering with joy or to manage our suffering with doubt. To manage our season of suffering saying, Lord, what do you want to get out of me in this season? Because you don't waste a season. Or to just walk around with complaint and to be downtrodden. We all have a choice. And Jesus made a choice in the garden to love us enough to suffer for us. To love us enough to go beyond the pain of his preference to take on the nails. It's in this love that we see what Darius Daniel says. He says, no one benefits from a love we feel, but a love we express. And in all of our lives, we know that sometimes people can tell you they love you, but I can show you better than I can tell you. I know some of you are wrestling with this right now in your home. You ain't never as a couple spent this much time together. Come on, be honest, be honest. Look at them right now and say, I ain't never had to spend this much time with you. I don't like the way you cook. I don't like the way you clean or watch this. I don't like the way you chew your food. Come on, some of y'all have argued about the chewing of food. Why do you got to chew so loud? Why, why does it feel like your spoon hits the plate louder than any other bowl in the house? And so many of us, if we be honest, we're looking at our lives, we're saying, man, this is all new. This is all something different. But the truth of the matter is, no one benefits from a love we feel, but a love we express. In the midst of all of this that's happening in our lives, we still have to continue to express love. We still have to continue to show love for one another. We still have to push through the inconveniences of the right, see this moment right now in history and say, no, but on the other side of this, I will show you love. And Jesus models that for us better than anybody else when he goes to the cross. So when we commune with God, we commune with Jesus because we want to remember what he did for us. When I look at the word communion, it's defined as the act of sharing or holding in common participation. I, lo I love to say it like this. Communion is about what we remember and what we respect. What we remember and what we respect. You know, many first century Christians took communion weekly. It was a part of their weekly routine to remember the love that Jesus had for them. And then they would add an extra layer of responsibility to it or reverence by and saying things like in the book of Corinthians that for this reason many are sick among you because they don't respect or truly reverence these moments. That's why communion is not about religion. It's about relationship. Because we remember what we love. I want to read you this quick passage of Scripture, 1 Corinthians 11, verse 23 through 30, contemporary English version. It says this as part of the instructions for communion. I have already told you what the Lord Jesus did on the night he was betrayed. And it came from the Lord himself. He took some of the bread in his hands. Then after he had given thanks, he broke it and said, this is my body, which is given to you. Eat this and remember me. After the meal, Jesus took a cup of wine in his hands. This is my blood. And with it, God makes his new agreement with you. Drink this and remember me. The Lord meant that when you eat this bread and drink from this cup, you tell about his death until he comes. In other words, he said, whenever you do this, don't do it casually because you do it as a representation, as an example to many around you of what you remember and what you respect and what you value and what you appreciate and who I am in your life. Can I tell you, I believe that today's communion is just as powerful as any communion you've ever taken in a church. Because there's maybe a cousin in your house right now or a friend or a coworker, or a neighbor who's looking at you and saying, I recognize this communion re re reflects who you love and who you value and you value the spirit of Jesus in your life. Verse 26 says this, the Lord, verse 27, but if you eat the bread and drink the wine in a way that isn't worthy of the Lord, you sin against his body and blood. That's why we must examine the way we eat and drink. And if you fail to understand that you are the body of the Lord, who? Each and every one of you. You will condemn yourselves in the way that you eat and drink. You know, the reality of this is this. As we look at all of our lives, we all have an opportunity to remember Jesus on this day. And not just this day, but many days. To say, he loved me enough to make a tough choice. He loved me enough 
to make a decision in that garden not to ask one question, but to ask two. First question, Father, take this cup from me. But it's in the second question that we should be most reflective of today. Father, what do you want? And it's in those conversations, in that moment in the garden, that Jesus takes the next step to the nails because he needed the nails so that we could have the gospel of victory on the other side. But let us also reverence and respect this moment, preparing our hearts for what it means. I know many of you might have different things in your hands right now. Maybe you got some saltine crackers if you grew up in a church like mine, or maybe you got some bread because you fancy. Here's the truth of the matter. The truth is, it doesn't matter what's in your hands. It matters what's in your hearts. You know, I begin to think about these communion cups that were in the back of our church. You got boxes of these. Boxes on boxes of cups of communion. And each box is full of what is supposed to represent what we remember and what we respect. Can I be honest with you? Communion cups mean little if we don't have communing hearts. I'm going to say it again. Communion cups mean little if we don't have hearts that are ready to be intimate with the Father. So I want to encourage you for the next few moments. I want you to just prepare to take communion with me. It doesn't matter what's in your hand. Right where you are, God cares about what's in your heart. I want you to close your eyes right where you are. I want you to think about what Jesus did for you in that garden. I know we talk about the cross, but it was in the garden that he made a choice. A choice for each and every one of us. To love us beyond his preference and beyond his pain. Take a few moments. Let's remember. Then also, Let's reverence this moment. I say, I don't care if I'm in my house. I don't care if I'm at my job. I don't care if I'm in my car. My heart appreciates all that the Father did for me. A few more moments. this little hymn. What can wash away my sins? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. And what can make me whole again? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Sing one more time. Say, what can wash away my sins? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. And what can make me whole again? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. I'm singing, oh, precious is that flow that makes me white as snow. No other fount I know, nothing but the blood of Jesus. I want you to take me. 